Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, as uh, Boyd gave me a way to flattering an introduction, I am Ali Hussain. I am the co-founder and CTO of Flux Seven. In case you don't know about us, we're uh, an Austin-based cons uh, consulting company focused on DevOps. Focused. Uh, we're roughly 40 people, so uh, relatively on the small side. And uh, we have a very narrow focus in what we do. So we focus on Amazon Web Services, HashiCorp tools, Ansible, uh, Docker. We end up deploying Jenkins all, over the, all across the board and some chef, uh, uh, some chef work. And what we found is that with this focus, you get to be really good at one thing rather than just uh, dilute yourself of trying to do every single thing that, uh, under the sun. Uh, and because of that, we do actually have a decent number of awards, and uh, the salespeople are going to hate me for just skipping over that. Okay. <laughs> now, um, uh, one thing that we, uh, we focus a lot on the DevOps part and making sure that we're automating everything and we're creating good workflows that, uh, uh, that work for, uh, for our customers. And... Uh, the problem that we're trying to uh, we're going to talk about here today in this talk about Vault. Well, we want to automate everything, and we have this ambition. Everything needs to be defined in code, and it's a brilliant idea until you ask, "Okay, what do I do about the passwords?" I mean, come on. Uh, we've all been using computers for the last uh, two or three decades, depending on how old we are. Uh, and you remember the first advice about passwords, do not write them on a sticky. And essentially, when we say, okay, you automate an application that has a password. Okay, a quick show of hands. Anyone has an application that does not have any secrets in it? Okay, well, those guys obviously did not attend this talk. So I would say that's a bad sample, uh, a sample that we're working with. But... Uh, Pretty much anything will have some kind of a secret in there. It's going to have credentials to go to your GitHub and download the code. It's going to have credentials to uh, uh, to log into your database, to access uh, third-party APIs that you're using. Anything bigger than a toy needs to have some kind of secrets in there that you can't just share. And... Uh, we need to get those into the application somehow. We can't depend on a human being ent manually entering, changing in the config file, because, well, that's not automated. So, uh, what do we need? Well, on a day-to-day -day level, we need to make it easy to be able to uh, provide the correct secrets. Um, and... Uh, we need to be able to control who can access the, uh, access the secrets to make sure that they're not leaking. Otherwise, they won't be secrets. And the other part of it is we need to think about what will happen if things go wrong. We uh, need to make it easy to remediate the issue, and a part of that ends up being being able to see what the actual issue is, so how do you audit it. And the most important part, because we are all lazy, is we need to make it easy to set up, because we're all lazy. So uh, let's go through a few of the options that we can have for uh, uh, keeping the secrets and distributing them. Uh, the first one that we talked about was, well, we can remember them. Uh, the second one we can talk about was we can code them, and these are essentially the two first, uh, first two options that you look at, with our, uh, which are kind of free. And then we're going to uh, talk very briefly a bit about uh, uh, what some of the configuration management tools are doing um, and what other uh, custom configuration options we have. Uh, finally, we're actually going to start discussing how Vault addresses the issue and how it compares against the different tools that you have. So uh, for that matter, I am going to mostly focus on keeping it uh, basic. But if you guys uh, have any questions f at any point, feel free to ask them. And if you guys want to uh, know more, uh, uh, we can take it offline and you guys can, uh, can bug me after the talk. OK, so remember them. Uh, well, uh, first thing, uh, why, we, uh, why we just knocked it out in the beginning was no go, because it uh, 
uh, fails the ease of use, there is no way you can actually automate entering in the secret for a thousand people. Uh, another thing that I would actually like to point out is that if you are uh, using secrets uh, by remembering them and a human being uh, entering them manually, they are, you don't have as good an access control as you think. Uh, that sticky note the, you passed on to the dev team so that they can actually, uh, uh, so that they can enter the note, uh, I bet you that sticky note has uh, been passed over to 10 different other people that you did not think would be getting it. So, um, not only is, uh, does, uh, is it uh, not practical from the usability standpoint, it is not even good access control, and there are absolutely no audit logs to who said who to what and uh, what was uh, who who copied and wrote down what sticky note. So uh, I would say this is uh, that's a no go. Code. Yeah. What can go wrong? So uh, let's start with why it is actually done so much. And I am going to insist that it is done a lot. The reason I'm going to insist that it is done a lot is because if you try to commit an access key to your GitHub in a public repo, Amazon will end up canceling that access key. And they will end up canceling that access key because so many people before you did the same thing and racked up huge AWS bills. So uh, lots of people are doing that. Why are they doing it? Well. The automation is free. You already have the automation and how to deploy the code. You already have some process for deploying your code. You don't have to do an extra step. Uh, now, wh uh, what makes it a very bad thing, other than the mistaken release of the source code to, uh, the, uh, into a public re uh, repo, uh, their access control is very hard even if you handle your source code exactly correct. The people that should have access to the, uh, to the production database password, those people are not the same people that should be developing the code. Uh, there's, and it becomes extremely difficult to separate out who can do what. So uh, the access, uh, it's not possible to implement a good access control, and the reason the reason why this, uh, uh, why the idea of actually putting in secrets in code uh, deserves uh, the people's eyebrow, is it? Is because once it goes into code, you are not going to be able to get it out. Once it gets checked into that uh, over, uh, SCM, it is, uh, it is there forever. You can try really hard to remove it. It is not going anywhere. So you'd better uh, not put it in there in the first place. So that's good. Now we're actually getting something real with config management tools. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with data bags, and encrypted data bags, uh, uh, Ansible Vault? Yeah. And now we're actually getting somewhere practical. Um, uh, those tools, they, actually, uh, they have them, and they've implemented this feature for quite some time uh, because it's a very real problem. The, easy, uh, the two easy solutions we've already uh, showed to you how, that's, uh, uh, how they are completely infeasible. Um, and uh, the tool, these tools still have their pros and cons. There are, uh, uh, with Ansible, uh, the one of the uh, issues that we, uh, that we saw with using Ansible Vault was you encrypt the complete file. Uh, A, there's one person that actually has that, uh, the access to uh, all your complete secrets. And B, you need to change uh, one item. It changes all across the board. There are no audit logs. So uh, th uh, there are some of the issues that, uh, that we see with these tools. Uh, where they are very good, they are very useful, and they will actually get you guys uh, uh, get you guys started if uh, uh, if your needs are not that complex and if uh, you're not ready to invest in uh, in a very thorough solution like Vault, I would say at least do something like this. One uh, more tool uh, that one more way of uh, so you can also have some custom configuration options. One thing to note is that Amazon has actually made this 
very easy. Uh, by uh, since around 2015, you could have uh, used KMS with a custom key, set up the correct permissions on your IAM profiles, and uh, store the data on S3. Amazon has actually made this a lot easier now with the use of EC2 parameter store. So uh, this, uh, so there may be, uh, there are other uh, options which you may be looking, at, which you can look at if you don't have any other tools. Uh, I know that GCP already also has uh, a KMS. Uh, and the caveat with this is custom means you're writing it, you're setting it up, you're doing every single thing for it. And that means uh, every time I write code, I write bugs mostly. So um, if you're a better coder than me, then uh, maybe you should go for it. Okay, now. Uh, to HashiCorp Vault. And uh, so let's go a bit more into, uh, so uh, it's going to take, uh, HashiCorp Vault actually uh, uh, goes, uh, it provides the basic functionality, but actually has a lot of other features uh, on top, which you can actually start to leverage things and uh, leverage and make it so that you don't actually end up being in this restricted uh, uh, with this uh, restricted uh, use of secrets. And uh, a lot of those things are, there really isn't any, compet any competitor to uh, the functionality. And so we're going to talk about some of that. Okay, so first, uh, Vault. Uh, there aren't that many uh, uh, good secret managers and uh, one way HashiCorp uh, Vault, uh, Vault is so good is because it is born in this generation. It's uh, coming from a company which uh, has really been catering to the DevOps crowd and it, uh, it understands their, uh, their needs. Uh, so for starters, everything is accessed with an API so you can start automating it however you, way you want. Um, and then we're, uh, as we're talking about automation, uh, Walt really tries to distinguish itself as we talk about uh, there are tools for the automatic rotation. Uh, Walt can automatically rotate credentials for uh, several tools and platforms. We, uh, how many over here, how many people over here use AWS? And how many of you guys use IAM instance profiles? Okay, good. The list is almost the same. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's a very good uh, thing that AWS did for us uh, that they um, allowed us to use uh, rotating uh, temporary generated uh, uh, credentials in our AWS instances. And, uh, and Vault will let you bring that data, uh, that functionality to other parts of your infrastructure, whether on premise, uh, on the cloud. You can rotate the secrets on your databases. You can, uh, a vault was providing fun uh, functionality for rotating uh, AWS credentials, I think before uh, instance profiles or around the same time. Um, and another point about automation is, um, how many of you guys are familiar with console template? So if you're using console, uh, console will, uh, it comes with a, uh, with a templating uh, uh, executable that can work alongside it, and it can, it's a templating language which will get the, uh, your data from console. And you can also use Vault as the backend for that. So uh, Vault is going to, uh, so that's a very easy way to automate, uh, automate your application by, you don't have to write your custom scripts to bring the, uh, uh, the required configuration from S3. Now you just use console template, uh, a tool that you would likely be familiar with if you're already using HashiCorp tools, and start using it. If you're using Terraform, you will, uh, Vault is pro uh, provided as a native uh, data source uh, for Terraform. So you can have uh, Terraform uh, talk to Vault, get the secret. Uh, uh, the, um, so, if you pull back the curtain and uh, behind, uh, you'll find out that it will get the secret and, sa and save the secret in clear text. Uh, but we're not going to think about that right now. What we're going to think about is 
uh, with Terraform, you can, ha you can have a data value be pulled straight from Vault. And uh, the workflow will look something like this. We have, um, we create uh, an admin, a human being comes in, they generate the secret and save to Vault. Uh, after that, the, we deploy the application. The application does not have any secrets in it. And uh, the application, as a part of its, uh, its startup pr uh, procedure, is going to talk to uh, uh, it's going to talk to what? Most likely through console template, and it will uh, pull in the secrets, and then it will authenticate your database or uh, or whatever uh, backend tool that you need to. So, in that sense, uh, a fairly simple workflow. Uh, anything else we do on top of that is uh, would be for improved uh, automation. We can uh, this will uh, or improved security. And we're going to talk about some of those topics uh, in a bit. Any questions so far? Yeah. yeah how the, uh, That's a good question. I'll talk about that in a bit. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry? Yeah, uh, Vault will be its own service running on its own servers. I'm not quite sure I understand what you... Yes. Uh, so uh, the question was, uh, how do we ensure the availability of Vault? And uh, the answer to that is Vault is built in with a high availability. Uh, it You can have as many nodes in a cluster. One thing to note is that the Vault nodes, when you put them together, you put them together for availability, not for scalability. Only one node can respond to requests at a time, and that is how you would do, uh, you would serve, uh, Vault would work within a data center. If you are talking about Vault working across multiple data centers, then Vault Enterprise actually has the feature where uh, for two Vault clusters to talk to each other. So, uh, <laughs> active passive. Sorry? Uh, it's uh, um, usually when you do it, when usually when you set up Vault, it doesn't have to be, uh, but you would set it up with console. Uh, console, uh, it, you can also use DynamoDB or a few other things as backends. I think uh, DynamoDB, Zookeeper, and I think etcd is also supported. Uh, there are some, I'm not sure actually. Uh, okay. And, but it can use uh, uh, all of those and basically all of the lift heavy part about synchronization, it pushes that to the storage backend and it uses that to coordinate who the master is and the active node is and everything else becomes passive. I would okay. think as a storage of your secret, not as a... Okay, got it. Uh, Depends on your application. That is, uh, I'm actually going to talk about that in a bit more detail too. Okay, uh, I got one more. Um, <laughs> so obviously, uh, my vault server isn't just sitting there going, "Yeah, here's a secret." Not to anybody who asked. It must be mm -hmm. some form of authentication. Yes. Which means, yeah. The, so where, where's the initial secret come from? Yeah, and that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it might just be the next slide. I don't know. Uh, maybe I should have uh, paid more attention when creating the slides. Uh, okay, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Yeah, we've uh, used both versions. Um, Enterprise, it's definitely providing the nice, pretty GUI. Um, yeah, the other... Uh, so the the GUI is one of the reasons. The second reason is support, especially if you have something very very mission critical on Vault. 
going back to why we need availability because if Vault goes down and it has the secret to your thousands of applications, you don't want your thousands of applications going down. Um, another thing that it does is it implements uh, HSMs, yes. Uh, hardware security modules, yeah. So uh, it ha uh, has an HSM integration, and uh, there's uh, the multi-data center integration. I'm going to talk a bit. Uh, I can uh, talk a bit more about HSM integration when we talk a bit about how sealing and unsealing vault works, uh, because uh, that uh, is an important, uh, uh, well, an important decision for a uh, vault enterprise. Yeah. Uh, so basically create your, uh, create your own thin layer between the actual vault API, yes. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's, uh, um, yeah, uh, we, uh, we do see that happen a lot, especially for uh, things that are going to be very common. Um, uh, in general, uh, when you're, uh, the way we see the whole DevOps relationship working is, uh, you have a company, that company would have a DevOps team, and we feel that the role of the DevOps team is creating the highway with the guardrails in it. And that means they make it as easy as possible for the developers to do their job. Connecting to Vault is not the developer's job. So that means the DevOps team does have the job of making it easy to, for application teams to be able to use Vault with as little difficulty as possible. And so for, uh, according to what the needs of the application teams are, they at least have to provide gui uh, uh, guidance, but preferably need to provide uh, standard, uh, standard tooling that the different teams can use to actually maintain their own secrets. I wouldn't say that I've seen something. Uh, so the question is, uh, are there any tools which kind of provide the, the API layer integration that uh, for Vault that applications can use? I am not familiar with any right now. I can tell you that Spring has one. We use Spring. Yeah. OK. So um, I said two things, uh, uh, automate and the other was secure. So um, here are some of the people that would be interacting with Vault. And uh, Vault really focuses on the idea of making sure that uh, uh, minimizing the footprint of people that can make any changes. So interestingly enough, uh, almost everywhere else we run into this issue where if you have access to the storage backend or you have access to the infrastructure, you can compromise what's running on top of it. That is actually not the case with Vault. Uh, with Vault, you need a quorum of Vault admins to, be, uh, to do pretty much anything. I'm going to get into uh, how we do that in a minute, but uh, uh, that's one of the uh, ways in which they really control the impact. And the, another way of thinking about this is you don't, uh, if your vault server gets broken into, you will have a lot of other problems. But uh, somebody changing the admin password for vault is not one of them. Uh, beyond that, you have the actual users. Uh, for uh, for those users, uh, you uh, Vault has all the systems that you would expect it to have. It implements ACLs. It allows turning on mutual SSL so that only uh, people on known machines are uh, accessing Vault. And it has integrations with a lot of the existing auth systems. So uh, Okta, LDAP, uh, a lot of those are integrated, uh, are implemented natively, and so you can start using whatever system uh, you have. So uh, my stance on security is that the best thing you can do for security is sort of like the best thing you can do for your workout. It's the process that actually works and that you will actually do. 
So it's kind of important to uh, have uh, to be able to use your existing directory structure instead of having to bake something new just for Vault. Because if you do that, it's more things to maintain, and it's just not going to work. Uh, applications, you can have IP-based restrictions on who can, uh, who can authenticate. You can, uh, there is an application authentication, which I am going to get into in a bit because of popular demand. Uh, there is uh, secret rotation. So we talked about this uh, a bit earlier, but you don't, uh, you don't, uh, you don't have to worry about the, the long-term uh, the credentials. What happens if they if they get destroyed? Something they can get uh, you can uh, replace uh, you can change them out. Okay. So, with access control, uh, everything involved is a path. Uh, and ACL rules apply on a given path, and they also define operation types available on that path. So, very simple concept, very powerful. Here's a bit of an example of how we would do it. So, uh, you create the HCL uh, file called mypolicy.hcl, and you'd specify the paths which are uh, re uh, reachable from there, ignoring the typo. Uh, you have a path secret slash foo policy equals write and path secret slash foo policy equals read. Uh, you apply that policy uh, to, uh, you, you write out the policy and apply it to a given token. And uh, then you get the ability to read and write uh, that, uh, that you, a token will have the ability to use a read and write that policy. You can apply policies to roles, to databases, to paths and databases. So it can be very comprehensive that way. So uh, I talked a bit about this uh, when we talked about, OK, you, uh, the sysadmins, the person that actually can, uh, lo can log into the Vault server cannot necessarily uh, access Vault. So this, uh, the way Vault does it is it's using Shamir's uh, secret sharing algorithm to maintain some keys. And uh, when, a, when a Vault server boots up, it is sealed. And until it is unsealed, it cannot function. All the data, all of the data is encrypted. There is nothing on the server. There is nothing on the storage backend that is unencrypted that you can uh, so. It's uh, Vault itself cannot actually uh, set up, which is why we have the very painful process in Vault. And when the server comes up, somebody has to go in, and they have to create and and they have to uh, people have to go in and unlock, uh, unseal Vault. Uh, the unsealed keys, they are generated at init time, and each of the designated uh, admins maintains a key to Vault. So this is a bit of how. Uh, vault is set up. You have uh, Shamir's secret algorithm. Um, uh, if you guys are not familiar, it lets you break up a secret, say this master key over here, into multiple uh, keys. Uh, you can spe uh, when generating the uh, when generating the uh, the keys, you can specify a minimum how many keys total there are, and a minimum of how many keys are needed before we can actually use, uh, uh, generate the master key. So uh, once you, uh, once Vault boots up, uh, the required number of admins, they go in, enter in their token, enter in their key, and uh, Vault is going to, uh, and once you've unlocked the, uh, unlocked the key, you, uh, Vault will create, use Shamir's algorithm to create the master key and use that to decrypt the encryption key. This encryption key is what is encrypting all of the secrets within Vault. So until you have the quorum of who, however many admins you set it to be, say you had uh, created five keys and you required three people to be present, uh, until you have a quorum of that many people, you will not be able to use that Vault server. It means that you get the security benefit. You also get the benefit of tolerating one or two people on vacation. Please keep in mind that this also means that if a vault server goes down, somebody does have to manually intervene and unseal the uh, vault because it will not be working in this state. 
Any questions so far? So on the high availability scenario, if you have, say, a crash, a vault, and you, need, you, know, you can't just auto reboot back up, right? Yes and no. Uh, so, uh, the, what you would do is you would not wait till you lose all of your vault servers. Um, so, you, uh, when you have a vault server come up, it comes up in a sealed state. As in that sealed state, all that you know is that vault is running and uh, it is absolutely not doing anything at all. Once you enter in the keys, if uh, there are, is no other server, it will go into active state, otherwise it will go into passive state. So. Uh, when we set up Vault, we, are, uh, we set it up so that uh, we have all three of our nodes, three being a usual number. Uh, we make sure that we unseal all three of them. It is perfectly okay to unseal uh, all three of them. That won't have an issue. Uh, and because it's not going to ever let, it come, uh, let the encryption key come out of RAM. Um, but... Uh, once we unseal the uh, once we unseal the key, uh, it will go into passive mode. If a wa an active node dies, a passive node will come in to replace it. Yes, because the unceremony has already happened. Any questions? Any more questions around that? Might have missed this. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I might have missed this. But how many key shares are required minimum? As many as you want. So you can uh, you can configure uh, you can configure n key shares and you can configure m at least m people present. So you can configure ten key shares and you can configure one person present if you trust all ten of those people, or you can uh, three five or two three is a more common uh, configuration so that you at least have a majority of people present. What's the consensus algorithm for HA? What's the consensus algorithm for HA? I am not sure. Uh, it's uh, uh, basically leaving all of that to console. Well, console definitely uses Raft. Yeah. That's one of their secures. Anybody? Other questions? Okay. So, and uh, this is uh, one of the, like one of the ways you can think about it is uh, if you take uh, if you have a vault instance running, you decide to take bake an AMI out of it. Uh, the person who baked the AMI and then who copied the AMI over, they cannot actually do anything with your vault installation. If somebody uh, makes an AMI out of your uh, out of your console uh, console nodes and has all of the data, they can't do anything because they still don't have the keys to decrypt it. If you manage to be in a position where you have a quorum of uh, vault admins acting maliciously against you, I feel like your problem is in HR. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so. Um, we have, uh, Vault also comes with uh, a lot of integrations. I mentioned some of these integrations for authentication. Uh, Okta, LDAP, Radius, GitHub, AWS. It can also have uh, backends. Um, I will uh, say one thing. As you're reading Vault documentation, the word backend does not mean anything because everything is a backend. Um, uh, when I say, uh, Vault actually calls those authentication backends, and it will call these secret backends, and then console, DynamoDB, whatever uh, you're using to store the data is going to be called the storage backend. So everything in Vault is a backend. Uh, not the best uh, terminology in my opinion, but uh, just something to, uh, good to know about when you're looking through the documentation because the term can be confusing without it. Um, but yeah, you can have uh, backends for generating SSH keys and loading them onto servers for uh, putting uh, putting a PKI SSL certificates for uh, generating AWS keys. And initially, they had uh, support for uh, databases like MySQL, Postgres, uh, Cassandra, but they actually recently deprecated that. So they have a generic data a database. Uh, uh, backend. I'm using the word too. 
so that they have a generic database uh, uh, database uh, backend, and you need to write the operations for uh, for creating new users, removing new users, and applying policies to those uh, to that backend. And yeah, uh, with these backends, uh, you get uh, features like automatic uh, credential rotation. Uh, one of our customers, they're actually using the Vault PKI backend in an IoT mechanism. They have all of these uh, um, solar panels across the world, and they need to call in to update their, up, update their firmware. When they call in, uh, Vault will actually Go, uh, give them a new certificate to start using, and so you can start uh, the uh, start authenticating the ser uh, the certificate uh, the servers that they're using. Okay, so um, now I want to talk a bit about uh, some of the challenges that uh, we uh, we've seen that you should watch out for when you're uh, using uh, Vault. Uh, before we move into that, any questions? Okay, sounds good. Oh, hang on, back here. Doesn't sound good. Uh, for the vault storage backends, um, is there any recommendation, for example, for like if you're using DynamoDB for the storage backend, um, how to uh, securely snapshot that or create a backup of that storage in the in the event that gets sure. removed? So for any storage back, uh, the question was, how do you back up? Uh, uh, how, how do you back up the storage backends? And uh, I would say the answer is not to look at Vault. The answer would be to look at your storage backend. Uh, for example, with a DynamoDB, you already know you have four nines of, of availability, which is pretty good. I'm not sure what the uh, durability number for DynamoDB is. Actually, that might be the durability number. But uh, uh, DynamoDB, um, previously, you, at least you had to use data pipeline to uh, back that up. And I would uh, use the same mechanism that I used. Uh, Vault, uh, for the most part, will be able to come up from the new servers. Uh, from, uh, the only exception might be some bookkeeping methods left in the directory that uh, for which are being used for saying, hey, somebody is the active node. So uh, other uh, outside of that, uh, you don't uh, you don't. There's nothing vault specific in there. It's just whatever you use. But otherwise, okay. Anything else? Okay. Uh, so. Uh, Boyd's question, secret zero. Um, yes, uh, all well and good. Once you're authenticated to Vault, you can start uh, copying in the uh, uh, in uh, the secrets. So um, the key being, how do you authenticate to Vault? Isn't that in itself a secret? Yes, it actually is. So uh, it doesn't completely solve. Uh, so the secret zero problem still survives. And uh, how, do you, how does an application server with no secret authenticate with Vault? Well, OK, before we talk about uh, uh, this, um, one thing that I would uh, ask is how difficult is it to overcome? Well, it's actually really damn difficult in the sense that it's a causal reality. So uh, we're kind of uh, hitting into uh, impossible without, any, uh, uh, without some external intervention uh, territory when we talk about uh, overcome. The other question is, what is a pro uh, how how big is the impact of this uh, issue? And uh, I would say that uh, even if you are being plagued by this issue, and we're going to talk about uh, how to uh, what things you can do to address it, uh, there are actual real benefits to having Vault in play. And now, uh, previously, you may have had. Uh, you would have had a lot of secrets that you need to work with. Now you have uh, reduced the number of secrets. Uh, in case something goes wrong, you have reduced the number of secrets that you would want to, to move around. Vault will also give you the ability to uh, do IP-based, uh, uh, IP-based uh, require that 
require a particular IP, IP address, so you can uh, decrease the blast radius again from that perspective. So uh, there, are, there are a few things that can uh, uh, over there uh, in mitigating, and, and, uh, and uh, several aspects are still very useful. But this is, I'm in no way trying to mitigate the issue in that, yes, it is a very real thing. So um, if we look at uh, some of the other uh, items over there, uh, if you're using a complete platform with the correct background information, with knowing what is deployed where, that is uh, one advantage uh, against just using Vault by itself. Nomad is, has a built-in integration with Vault, and so if you're using Nomad, Nomad will know which containers you launched how, and it will know how, uh, it will only let those containers access the appropriate uh, role in Vault. AWS with parameter store, so not a Vault solution, but uh, just wanted to point out that AWS with parameter store, one of the best things about it is that we're all familiar with AWS instance profiles, at least the people who use AWS. Uh, that solves the secret zero problem, which in itself is the biggest contribution. Um, Docker Enterprise is now releasing, uh, has now released secrets as a part of their enterprise offering. So um, a very, uh, a, a problem that is seen very commonly, a problem that, uh, for which different platforms have solutions. One thing that I would uh, that I would say, if you, there are ways to solve this issue uh, even more. Um, you, for if you're using Vault, you can create a security broker that acts uh, uh, as an intermediary for uh, getting the Vault credentials, and it can use a secondary mechanism to make sure that you are who you say you are. So. Uh, the flow for it would look a bit like this. Uh, we have the security broker over here. We have Vault, we have an admin, and we have a developer. The developer tells the admin, hey, I want, the, I, I want to create this new service. Uh, I, this is the app role for it. App role is the, is the authentication backend. I am still using that word. Uh, app role is the authentication backend that an application uh, would be using uh, to, uh, to log into Vault. It has uh, a uh, the role name and the secret as the two parts, uh, parts to it. Uh, the admin will go in, create the app role, assign the role permissions, and act it to the developer. Now, you come uh, over here. Uh, on the production server, you request the Vault credentials. Uh, the broker goes in and it verifies through a secondary mechanism. If you're in, if you're on AWS, uh, it can uh, the broker can already have AWS uh, access credentials and it can request them using the uh, it can check during, uh, using the API. Are you who you say you are? Do you have the uh, do you uh, do you have the correct IAM role? Do you have the instance tag to be able to use? Uh, to be able to uh, uh, use these, uh, use this app role that you're uh, you're claiming uh, you're allowed to use. Okay, you do. Uh, uh, fine, I will let you read the role. Uh, I will. Uh, so fine, I'll read the roles. Uh, create read uh, read the role ID. Uh, generate a secret for it and return the role ID or secret ID. This broker can be something simple. This broker can be uh, a part of your Jenkins job. Uh, your Jenkins job for deploying the application could itself actually place the secrets as a part of the uh, deployment process because uh, you can have, uh, you can set up your, uh, you can authenticate your Jenkins manually by saying, hey, this IP address, it can use these, uh, these credentials to log in. And from there, the Jenkins is able to, uh, you, uh, Jenkins is able to authenticate itself and generate the credentials it needs. So. Uh, this is kind of the mechanism that you would use for uh, using Vault with the uh, secret zero. Uh, any questions? Yes. So it still seems that you've got some sort of credentials to tell the broker who you are. You uh, you will, and uh, so the broker can be using some external information. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the question was: It still seems like you have uh, some credentials to tell the broker who you are. 
And uh, I would say that the broker uh, ha can, doesn't have to rely on the information provided by you. The broker can, uh, the broker can check the information, uh, can check your claim externally by talking to the API because it is your own, uh, it can, by the API for whatever platform you're using because it is custom code that you're using. So uh, in your case, you may just need to uh, say that uh, you may need to lock down who can edit tags and then the uh, the broker can look up the, uh, can look up the tags for that instance if only uh, if only admins are allowed to uh, edit the tags so uh, yes there is some information that the broker is relying on uh, that is kind of a matter of fact uh, there will always be something but you can control what that information is and you can make, uh, you can customize it and you can uh, the, you can fix the problem of you presenting the information to being information being checked by you, by the broker. Did that answer the question? Okay, anything else? Okay, yeah. So you mentioned um, Docker Enterprise Swarm mm -hmm. has a secrets yeah. thing. Uh, so does Kubernetes, so do I imagine some other things. My impression looking at them is they're pretty good on the delivery side and kind of sucky on the storage side. Okay. Is there a way to integrate Vault to hold them and then, but use their mechanisms to deliver them? I have not looked into that, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? No, okay, thanks. Okay, uh, the second issue that Boyd raised was, so how, who's doing all the heavy lifting? And the answer is, well, you. So, um, the dynamic secrets, they are an extremely powerful feature, uh, but they need application changes. Uh, especially if we're talking about, uh, and even if we're not using dynamic secrets, you may not, uh, so let's say you're not using dynamic secrets, you change the database password, it means that now you have to do uh, a redeploy of your application. That's not too bad. Uh, if you are using dynamic secrets, you're not going to go in and do somebody going in and doing a redeploy every uh, eight hours. So uh, you would do, want to do exactly what Boyd talked about. You would want to have console template looking up uh, vault and pulling the secrets from there, updating the config file that you have, and continue, uh, and it would com uh, continue to work. Caveat, most applications really will not work that well with that. Um, Nginx, it has a reload operation. Apache has a reload operation. So uh, if you're talking about your Nginx server, it will be a, a, a you'd write this console template, it will update the config file, and then uh, you will, uh, to roll out in the configuration, you would press the reload. Uh, enter the reload command as a part of the console template, and uh, voila, you have all of your new configuration in place. A lot of applications that most people write, they don't have the reload operation working. The only way to actually fix uh, 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 fix the uh, uh, to update the configuration is to just restart the application, which is bad. And uh, there are ways around that, uh, but you would have to code them. Uh, you can have console template uh, uh, update your config files, so everything good now. And you would restart the servers if there is no reload option. But the, uh, the biggest issue that we're trying to deal with is we don't want all of our servers being restarted at the same time. Uh, most of us have become good enough to not have state in our servers. Uh, but um, we, uh, even if we did, uh, you'd imagine that with a restart, we have some mechanism of being clean uh, with it. Uh, but if you, uh, to make sure that you don't uh, ha uh, restart all of your servers at the same time. Fortunately, when you set up console alongside of Vault, you also set up console 
alongside of Vault. Uh, and console can very easily be used. Uh, console has built-in support for uh, dynamic locks, and you can use that to make sure only one person is able to restart the application at a time. So uh, right now, uh, so you're again into distributed systems programming. How, uh, fortunately, it's not that complex thing that you're programming. So not too bad and still possible. Did that answer your question, Boyd? And the answer is painfully. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, let's go into a few best practices. Uh, first, best practice. Vault is a security product, yes. It will help you in doing security. It will not secure things for you. It's still your job to follow all of the security best practices. It gives you features to be able to observe the principle of least privilege. It gives you uh, the ability to use short life cycles for secrets and tokens. It gives you the ability to audit. It's kind of your job to use all of those things. It's not going to just work. Uh, uh, it's your job. Uh, it's just not going to. Uh, it needs cooperation from you. Another best practice delete the root token after the initial setup. So uh, the root token is able to do anything in Vault. There is no reason for anyone to exist that can do anything in anything. Uh, you uh, delete the root token after setting up the initial admin accounts that you need to be able to uh, do your day-to-day -day functions. In case you need to create a new root token, you can do that if you have uh, the key shares, which means uh, you have a quorum of vault admins. So uh, uh, if you need to do something that is so critical, uh, it, uh, you, can get, uh, uh, you can get that quorum of, uh, of admins and, uh, ready to help you out. Another issue, always enable uh, audit logging. Uh, in Vault, the audit logs will uh, log every single API request. They will log who did them, what was their IP address. It will also mask anything that it considers secret. So instead of actually putting the, uh, uh, put, uh, including all of your passwords in the audit log, it's going to replace them with a SHA hash. So you can, the good thing about that is you can actually go up and like try to find the history of a data without actually knowing what data what the actual da content of the data is and uh, uh, the next step to do is actually create logs on suspicious log entries uh, going to your question you asked about uh, how oh it's not really true a uh, high availability my answer was well you never let it get to the point where three of your vault servers are down you and uh, you should create logs and uh, send out a notification if your vault servers are down. Um, you don't have to do it using logs because the vault uh, status command will uh, give you different HTTP return codes, but you can do it to, uh, using logs and to see uh, which of your servers are unsealed. And if you're seeing something that is suspicious behavior, again, you're still implementing uh, everything that is needed for your organization's security. What is just helping you get there? One more thing I would say, this goes back to Boyd's question uh, about difficulty. Um, so, uh, a lot of, using a lot of the features will require application improvements. Uh, the good thing, of, uh, the bad thing about application improvements is they never happen when you want them to happen. So, be iterative in your rollout. You can still start using Vault, and you can still start uh, improving a lot from the status quo by just making small improvements. You, you don't need to have dynamic secrets for your databases today. You can just uh, write a small script, which on boot up is going to look up the current secrets on Vault and uh, start using uh, static secrets. And then once people become more comfortable with it, you can start uh, you can start saying, okay, guys, I think we're going to do this. We're going to go to uh, dynamic secrets, and we're going to be updating our secrets every hour. Uh, but the key is to make the small improvements, make the small wins, instead of trying to make it a behemoth of a project, which means it will never get done. Um, 
as you're setting up Vault, you guys should pay attention to the organization. As I mentioned, the ACLs are based on the path, which means that now the paths are extremely important because they determine the, uh, that is pretty much how you're going to determine all of the ACLs. So you, you need to put some thought into how do I want to organize this information? Do I need to be talking uh, thinking about separating it out by business units, by application teams, by services, or all of the above? Uh, and you need to create a, a paths accordingly. You need to create guidelines for the developers and hey, when you're creating something, put things here. And you need to uh, implement the corresponding rules in ACLs. So, um, Vault, uh, I showed you a lot of how it provides a secure solution for distributing, uh, uh, distributing secrets, and I also talked to you through a bit of the challenges uh, uh, that, will require, uh, that you will require to work with for your customization. And the stakes over the here are fairly high. You guys need to prepare accordingly when setting up Vault. You need to be sure uh, you are securing everything because this is the gates to the uh, this is the keys to the kingdom, or well, it's more like the keys to every house and footlocker in the kingdom. Uh, so, uh, with that, I'd like to open the floor to questions, as if it wasn't already open. So, how do you manage your policies in Vault? Um, How do you uh, keep them updated? Do you manually input them? Do you source right? Uh, so far, uh, I think uh, Vault has uh, released the ability to be able to uh, come uh, from code. I have to double check actually on that. Uh, please don't quote me on that. Uh, but uh, uh, you uh, manually uh, would be one way, and the other part of it becomes on. This is why having thought through your organization is really important so that the policies you create are policies that make sense. Uh, another thing that you can do if you're hooked up to LDAP, you can push the policy part uh, the, uh, to LDAP groups and have Vault just follow what, L, what is being done in LDAP. I have a question for the crowd. How many of you pictured in your mind when Ali was talking about the key quorum and you know and whatnot, the Council of Elrond. <laughs> All right, free hug ops to anybody who can get that meme up on Twitter <laughs> first <laughs> with the hashtag Austin DevOps. <laughs> Other questions? Just throw it, boy. Just throw it. <laughs> That would work too. Um, so the key shards for the admin keys, um, is it possible to recompute those later if you add or remove people as time goes on? Yes, it is possible to recompute those. It requires a quorum of vault admins. Makes sense. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Carl. Other questions? Just for all of you who are going to look at this again on rack on the YouTube channel. Uh, it's kind of related to your ask about maybe a sharing or intro. If anyone's actually using Vault in production, maybe to describe how they've set up some of these things to the level that's possible would be useful, like kinds of policies, kinds of challenges they had with specific, you know. We're in the early stages, so we haven't made it to production yet, but if anyone has, it'd be interesting sure. to see uh, some of their so challenges. I shared uh, some of the challenges we've seen. No, and Well, that question, I think I'm actually going to open up to the floor. Did any, anyone have anything they want to share about how they did it and making it easy to use? How many minutes did I Define production. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're pretty close with it right now, and we're using, we're using Nomad's integration with it because it takes a lot of the key management off of you. Essentially, so you don't have to do the app role type authentication, and uh, you just set up Nomad with the permissions that it needs, and it manages the renewals and everything. And it, the only caveat is that your Nomad key needs to be 
permanently renewable. Um, it can't ever expire or else you'll have problems. Well, it, it, it can be. We're, we're using Ansible to configure our Nomad servers. So we've put the, the, the token that Nomad is going to use to get the tokens into, a, um, into a, an Ansible vault. And then um, we could make it less renewable if we were um, had tower and had a job running to reconfigure the Nomad servers every 30 days or whatever. We could make it expire in 45 days if we once we get there. We don't we don't have tower up yet, but we're getting there. But um, once we do, we could make that token expire in 45 days, rerun the job every 30 days. Um, but there would have to be you know somebody that goes in and creates a new token every quarter or something. Yeah, that's the secret zero kind of thing. So we're we're kind of, but the thing is, we we have it in a in a in a, an Ansible vault that we then have to know the password for, or at least we have to be able to give Tower the password for. So it's, you still got the chicken, you still got the egg. And uh, what we added to that, like you, I mean, automating that is a lot simpler than getting Ansible Tower. The automating that is running a cron job, and uh, that updates uh, uh, the, your uh, renews your credentials every few hours. So, and we've done that. Yeah, no, the, the cron job just runs on Nomad, and Nomad already has the credentials with that token, so it's self-sufficient. So, question: You guys are from Q2, right? So, would you be willing to come back and do a code on screen? This is our implementation of Console Vault. Whether you're in production or not, the fact that you've gotten that close—is uh, that something Q2 would allow you to do? He lives in <laughs> I can't. I can't fly here. Man, I'm, sorry. I'm actually very honored that you flew here to Austin just so for my talk. We did. And we did fly Thomas Mann <laughs> from Salt Lake City to here. He's the guy who uh, came up with Salt Stack. So we did actually have him come and Wait, talk. Are you him. from Salt Lake City? I'm from here. I moved to there after. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, talk to me a bit. Uh, uh, I would be willing to come back with some diagrams of how the architecture is set up and, and, and the Ansible around it. I, I can't. I can't show you the libraries that they're using to, to in the code. Yeah, because we wrote middleware for it, essentially, yeah. okay. to interface I, between I'm, our I'm apps. The, I'm the ops side of things. Yeah. So, I don't so you, yeah, but you could basically take it one level deeper than, or maybe even two, than what, what Ollie gave us yeah. for, as a great overview. Yeah. That would be super awesome. Yeah, I've got mm -hmm. some architecture diagrams I made for operations folks. So okay, I will find you. <laughs> I'm going to tweet it. We're, we're about at the same stage. Hang on here. Here you go. We're about at the same stage, uh, and our Python developers built a little mini Python library so that they could just plug it into our stuff. I don't know, Java site, Andrew, did they do the same thing? Yeah, we'd have to go back and check, but the same thing, we could we could join up and maybe do a joint uh, a comparison. This is the way we're doing it. This is what we learned. This is what we're looking at, because um, we're about at the same stage. We're That's why I said, define production, because, yeah, it's there. Uh, Yeah. They took they took the Scala stuff and just rewrote it and in, into Python and yeah. We probably give you that. That's nothing, right? Yeah. Hang hang on just a sec. Okay. Okay. For for the people who just offered that information, what's the time frame for start to where you are now? I mean, if you were going by actual time, probably I think the requirement came about five months ago, but once we got it really rolling, it was about two months. And we actually, HashiCorp was really, I mean, if you're interested in their enterprise stuff, they've been really helpful to us, but we, we haven't bought into that yet, but just expressing interest got us a lot of help with it. And we, we, we're probably planning on going that route re regardless. Which I would recommend if you're going into production anyways. Yeah, same from our side. The requirement probably came quite a ways back. Um, more than five months, Sandra. Probably more than five months. But um, uh, we had a security architect on staff, and, and this was kind of part of his designs. Uh, he left, and the day he left, we turned it into high gear, and it's been about 30 days. So we, uh, we, we sat him down and said, all day today, tell us, Vault. Uh, and so it's really moved very rapidly from there. Um, we are on the, I'd literally just sent an email uh, to my counterpart saying, guess what guys, uh, enterprise is on our horizon. So 
we we are going to have to pay for enterprise if we use it, or we're going to have to choose something else. Uh, 30, uh, 30, man, um, days, thirty calendar days. Man, the mythical from yeah, uh, <laughs> from the operation side because that's most of my world. Um, we've probably put 10, 14 hours in so far. Um, uh, from the development side, I'm sure they've done the prior work. I know he did at least at least 120 hours. And right now, I mean that, but that's design, documentation, architecture. Like we're going some, from some pretty well drawn up templates and, and instructions. So the Scala stuff, those guys pumped out in less than a day. So it must have been just a couple hours of rewrite work. Yeah, and, and we're using Terraform to uh, to do the provisioning and Ansible to do the configuration management. So, you know, it took us about you know two days to get the um, the Ansible together and building up the infrastructure. Once you have the automation, I mean, I I built an entire production infrastructure yesterday, um, and and it's just all of this HashiCorp stuff just fits together and and goes up so smoothly. In fact, we were we were saying it's a little scary sometimes how well it works. Oh, sorry. Oh. Um, so here's what I heard. <laughs> John, <laughs> Eric, <laughs> Eric's buddy. In October, I have an opening. Andrew works for me. All right. There we uh, Andrew. Will? Uh, Will? Will he, you too? Uh, I heard, hey, let's do a compare and contrast of vault implementations. This is how we did it. This is what we ran into, et cetera, et cetera. So are you guys seriously signing up for that? All right, vol vault off. <laughs> it's, it's like gymnastics in the Olympics. There we go. Okay, fantastic. Um, so uh, just a quick show of hands, since this is obviously a, a crowd interested in vault. How many of you would be interested in attending something at that level of detail? Well, there's a gold mine. Yeah, so you should start a startup on talking about vault. <laughs> Other questions, you guys? I actually, yeah, Stu. I actually had to make uh, uh, one thing that you pointed out was asked me about vault enterprise versus open source. Um, one of the things uh, they are, I showed you guys a whole Shammer secret sharing uh, thing. Uh, and the concerns about, oh, somebody has to get paged and uh, unlock it. Uh, my understanding is that, is that Vault has something on the way, that, something that they want to implement to fix that, but that is going to be using an HSM, which again, well, it means you're going to be shelling out money for an HSM, but it also means that you'd be using uh, the, uh, uh, that uh, Vault Enterprise would have that feature only. Uh, this is based on rumors, so disregard if it was. Uh, uh, I cannot tell you. <laughs> I, I cannot tell you not because I'm not allowed to. I cannot tell you because uh, I, I've been. Uh, I've had to talk to so many people that I don't know what the actual source is anymore. I had a, uh, a quick question. You had mentioned that you had written your Python code for talking to Vault from scratch. Is there a reason why you didn't use a pre-existing module? They copied the, they just translated the style stuff. Ah, okay, never mind. Why, why not use an existing Python module? Because there are a couple. I was just wondering if they're terrible or if there was a different reason. You'd have to ask my developers. <laughs> I can summarize that in three letters. N-I-H. <laughs> Other? Uh, sorry, man. I'm sorry. I wasn't So one thing that, that we're looking at trying to do right now is um, have secrets in Vault stream to 
Kubernetes secrets. Um, what should you not store as a, as a secret? You know, because you can make a generic secret backend and you can store an entire config in there. Uh, should we not be doing an entire config that has uh, secrets in it? Or should we take that secret and then pass it to a, like a config map or something? You could store the entire config if you really want to. Do. There's nothing stopping you. Um, the annoyance with that would be now all of a sudden all of your config is a secret. So something like that I would prefer doing console template with. Uh, having said that, um, we did store entire configs for uh, before Vault when we were using S3 and KMS. But then again, uh, we didn't want to bring in the new tool of console template. From my perspective, you're not that loud. <laughs> Uh, on that one, the, for me, the question is, who's the consumer and how open is that? Uh, for me, I want every developer and every ops staff, in fact, even the implementation engineers, to see configs, just not be able to use the pieces that make it unique to production, right? So I only pull out those things that are unique to production. Everything else, let, let it go. QA, stage, don't care, don't care, don't care, right? So what he that, said. that's where I make that decision. Anything else? Oh, there we go. Thanks, Bob. So I had two questions. Uh, the first is with regard to scale. I'm wondering what the largest vault deployment in the room is in terms of number of secrets or the amount of data stored. First so, uh, before we go into the largest vault deployment in the room, I can say I've done some benchmarking and uh, the answer is Vault isn't really doing much. Uh, like, well, yes, it's doing a lot of, in, uh, it's doing encryption and decryption and doing a lot of CPU heavy stuff. And CPUs are kind of cheap. Uh, so, uh, Vault will likely not be the bottleneck. What will likely the be, be the bottleneck would be console in case you have console in the back end. And console is, Scalable. It actually doesn't scale. It's not a, a console is not horizontally scalable. Uh, adding new nodes slows you down because the only thing that the new nodes are doing is increasing your high availability. Um, we've uh, benchmarked console at maybe thirteen thousand uh, uh, mixed operations per second. So, not something that you have to worry about. I have a second question. I do. Depends on the environment and the customer. Sorry, what, can, uh, so the question was how many console servers? Yeah, just how many console servers for your vault backend. Uh, so the question was how many console servers we're running for the vault backend. Um, usually the answer is three. So my second question was with regard to production deployments. Uh, have you seen production deployments doing automatic sealing of Vault uh, when suspicious activity is detected? And what did that stack look like for detecting suspicious activity? Well, not using Vault, but uh, actually, no, not using Vault for a different. Per no, no uh, by saying not using Vault, I mean not using Vault for the actual sealing. Um, we uh, we worked very closely with uh, uh, with some customers on that uh, on that and created. Run books for them for each of the scenarios that they would want to work with. Uh, we didn't take the, uh, take the step to doing it automatically, but uh, uh, we did bring it down to okay. This is uh, in this scenario, you may want to. Uh, this is how you would seal vault, and there are bas there are commands built into vault for sealing it. So that's uh, if you wanted to run that automatically, if you're very comfortable about. Uh, not triggering false positives, then that would be a way to go. The other th thing to think about is a part of security is not letting your infrastructure go down, and you may not want to be doing something so aggressive and going down to uh, uh, for that reason. And it does create a vector that somebody can attack to bring things down. Uh, 